Welcome to EAMC Virtual. We're so glad you're joining us remotely, and we look forward to seeing you next year in person. This session is being recorded, and all EAMC virtual session recordings will be posted this Friday for you to view at your leisure. Now, let's get on with the show. And hello, I'm Edie Brown, an EAMC veteran. And joining me today is our very special guest and one of my most personal friends, Dave Grohl. Thank you, Dave. And in the way of memorabilia, I had to go back and find some things from our past. I met you 19, 20 years ago when you came to Baltimore to be introduced to family and friends when you got engaged to the one and only beautiful, smart, wonderful Geordie Blum. And then I found this. Can you all? Oh, yeah. <laughs> from your wedding. And I think in August, you're going to be celebrating 18 years, right? It's absolutely true. Yeah. I mean, that picture was taken in our backyard because we had the wedding here at the house. Yes. And, um, and we're still here, you know? Still we're here, but you rebuilt the house. We did. We we had to remodel because we started having so many kids. We needed more space. <laughs> yeah, I know. When I came to visit, I said, "This looks different, Jordy." And I have to share one more picture. Do you remember that? Oh, look at that! This little Violet girl. Jordy, you and Violet when we vacationed at Beth at Dewey or Rehoboth in the yeah. summer with steamed crabs. Well, but you know, that's one of the, one of the things that we first bonded on when Jordan and I met is that since I grew up in Virginia, I used to go to Ocean City and Rehoboth and Dewey and stuff like that when I was a kid. So when we met and she said that she used to do the same, it was kind of this big bond between the two of us. And then when we, you know, when Violet was born to bring our first kid to Funland out on the, on the boardwalk right. and do all of that stuff, the same rides that we used to ride when we were kids, it was always really special. And to, and you know, that whole extended family was such a, I remember the first time uh, I came out to, to visit with everybody, I couldn't believe how many people and how long everyone had been connected. I thought it was the most beautiful thing. I, it, you know, family is very important to me. So I thought it was very, very beautiful. Yeah. It's been 53 years and we still have the same party every Sunday night. And then everybody goes to Funland. But anyway, let's get on with the show. So in okay. October, you're going to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for the second time. You were inducted with Nirvana and now for Foo Fighters. Congratulations on this remarkable achievement. And what does this recognition mean to you? Well, you know, when you're a kid and you start playing music, you never imagine something like that to happen. You just start playing music because you love it. And some people, I don't know what it is, whether it's something that's handed down in DNA or if it's just music gets its hooks in you. I think that um, there's a time in your life where you just sort of devote yourself to it, to playing and to learning music and performing music and listening to music and studying music. And that's the way I was when I was, when I was a little kid. So I really never imagined any of the, the success that I eventually wound up getting um, I just kind of, I just wake up in the morning and I just want to play, you know, I want to pick up a guitar. I want to write a song. So when things like that happen, it kind of blows your mind. You know, you, it's hard for me to, I, I, I describe it like I'm standing beside myself watching someone else go through this life, you know, because it, there's so many incredible experiences. It's hard for me to believe that it actually happens to me. So something like the, the hall of fame, when Nirvana got inducted, it was so huge to me. I just couldn't even, I couldn't even process it. And then the Foo Fighters getting in again, it's, you know, it's so huge to me. It's hard for me to really kind of wrap my head around it, but I'm so happy for all the people we've worked with because we've worked with the same people for like 30 years, same manager, same accountant, same sound guy. It's like, we're, we're kind of like a big family. We're like kind of the same family that hangs out at Rehoboth every year. We just, just have instruments and run around the world playing music. That's wonderful. And twice. Wow, what an achievement. So last week and actually today, you announced something major. Do you want to share with everyone? Yeah, we're going to reopen Madison Square Garden on June 20th. And we got the call recently, only a few weeks ago. It wasn't in, 
it wasn't we had been planning this for a long time they just called and said hey we want to open y'all want to play and we said of course we've been waiting to play for you know a year and a half we've been waiting to play so it um you know to be able to tell everybody it's going to be a huge huge moment and a huge celebration so we've been rehearsing the last you know three weeks just getting ready because it's going to be nuts i can't wait Oh, I know. And so how do you really feel about getting back on the road after, you know, being away for 15 months? Well, I mean, you know, everybody's been shopping at the bed. And I mean, the, like I have, I dream about it at night. I dream about walking onto the stage and having an audience there and being able to, you know, play music for people again. But, um, you know, I think it's been a, it's for us, we've stayed productive and we've stayed creative and we've, we've, we've adapted to the new world and the new rules. And, um, you know, we try to keep it safe and we try to stay healthy and we try to make sure everyone's all right. And, but at the same time, we try to do our music and, and, uh, just kind of move forward. So I never, I never ever lost hope that shows would come back because human beings have to do it. That's like, people people have to get together and listen to music together it's that communal energy when people come together and sing a song um it, that makes you feel alive and so the last year and a half i i knew it was coming back i didn't know when but i kind of knew like it's going to come back it's going to come back and now it is and i'm so glad to be a part of it oh it, it's so exciting and also you're going to headline several big festivals so you know, how does that experience at a festival differ from playing in an arena? Well, usually when you're playing in an arena, uh, you're playing to your own audience, right? And so uh, whether it's the set list that you're writing or um, how you connect to the audience, when you're doing a festival, you know, more like, it's, it's, it's more likely that a lot of people have never seen you. And this will be their first time. So it's almost like, it's like being a new band. And so when you get out there on a festival stage, you really got to give it to them. Like, a, you know, you got to extend your hand to the audience and say like, okay, welcome to our world. This is the next two and a half hours. I hope you dig it. And so, um, but it's all about being inclusive. You know, to me, it's all about really sort of like turning, uh, turning the house lights on and looking at everybody and saying like, all right, we're in this together. We're going to do this for a couple hours let's do it. It's, you know, it's, it's like asking some, it's like, it's like a blind date and then asking <laughs> someone to dance. You know what I mean? So when you do an arena show, of course it feels a little bit more intimate than like a huge festival. Um, and it might be your own audience, but I really love, I really love big festivals where, where people are experiencing it for the first time. Cause it makes you feel like it's the first time too. You want to tell everybody which festivals you're doing? I know we're doing Lollapalooza and we're uh, in Chicago. I know we're doing Bonnaroo in Tennessee. We're doing Bottle Rock in Napa Valley. Um, they're the ones know. we know. What's that? I said they're the ones, you know, we kind of knew about. Yeah, those are the ones. I mean, it's crazy because, you know, one day you don't have a schedule and then the next day all of a sudden you got like 50 shows lined up. And so... and. Then my manager at one point, he was like, hey, we got an offer to play it, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, book it, let's go. I mean, I, like, it, it could be anything. We could be playing at a Wendy's, I don't care. I'm like, it's just like, yes, yes, go, let's do this. Oh, it's amazing. So now that we're coming out of this pandemic, how do you think playing shows will be different? Will, there, will you feel different or will you feel the same once you get that energy and you get on stage? Well, we... Um, you know, we did this live Vax concert at the SoFi Stadium in Los Angeles like a month ago, a month and a half ago or something like that. And um, and that was really the first time that we had been in front of people playing music. And so I, I wasn't nervous um, and everybody there was like, you know, it was, it, it seemed like a safe place. Everyone's being cool and everyone, but when you, when we got on stage and the lights went out, and like you hit a note on your guitar, the place went bananas, you know, because nobody had seen live music for so long <clears throat> that um, I think it's gonna be a learning experience. It's just different now, you know, it's not, it's not the same as it was, but there, we're taking these steps to slowly come back. And, um, you know, I think if everyone works together to make it work, 
then it's going to feel like it always did. So I, it's, I don't know, it's a really, it's going to be a learning experience. I mean, I know what I'm going to do when I hit the stage and that's going to be what I always do. Right. But, um, but everything else is just, it's just a new, it's a new world, you know, and I'm just happy it's back. And you know what I'm just remembering, you know, I, I know the David Grohl, the Foo Fighters, but I so remember when you played the guitar and it was just you at the Academy Awards yeah. when you remembered. And you know, well, anyway, all right. So your sixth uh, part unscripted television, uh, television series, Cradle to the Stage, was based on the critically acclaimed book by your mom, Virginia. Tell her I said hello. I will. And um, with your mom at your side, you visited several well known musicians to uh, learn about how they got on with their mothers. I think it was Pharrell Williams, Miranda Lampert, Tom Morello. So how did it feel to work on such a deeply personal um, kind of connection with, with your mom? Well, you know, my mom and I are like best friends and we always have been. I got so lucky that, you know, I was raised by this brilliant, uh, talented, strong, independent woman. She was a public school teacher for 35 years. She had a way with people that um, she's very altruistic and very empathetic. And she really, you know, she, 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 she knew how to connect to people. And um, when she retired from being a school teacher, uh, I said, what are you gonna do? She's like, I don't know. I can't, I can't, I can't just sit around doing nothing. And I said, well, if you're gonna travel, don't go on one of those cruise ship things. Like, come with me, like, I'll take you on the road. And so she jumped on the tour bus and we went all over the world together. And she got to see Australia and Japan and all over North America and Europe. And, and um, but while, while she was on the road with us, she was looking around, she's like, where's all the other moms? Like, hold on a second. Like, how come nobody brings their moms on the road with them? And so she went to go find them because she wanted to know their experiences. So that's when she wrote the book and she interviewed all these different mothers. But in that book, she also talked about her own experience as a mother because it, there were a lot of parallels between her relationships or her relationship with me and like Dr. Dre and the relationship with, with uh, his mom and Pharrell and his mom, Miranda Lambert. So when we had the idea to do the TV show, again, it was like, all right, let's, let's jump on a plane and fly around and talk to these families and talk about our shared experiences. And, you know, um, I think that, you know, the idea was to not put the spotlight on the artist so much. It was the, the idea was to put the spotlight on the mother. Cause at the end of the day, like they're the real rock stars. They're the ones that had to raise the crazy children who had a dream to take on the world. And um, so it was awesome. And we learned a lot about those people, but in doing it, we also learned a lot about ourselves. And she's, you know, she's my hero. She's just the coolest, coolest woman in the world. And it was, it was a real pleasure. And, and I'm so happy with the way it turned out. Well, it was great. And I have to, you know, remembering another funny thing, you played at the 930 club or something. And I went, your mother and I were standing there and all of these people kind of got away from yeah. us because here were these two elderly ladies <laughs> listening to rock and roll and they couldn't figure out what in the age we were doing there. But anyway. Well, that's the way it, you know, it always was with her. Like you right. know, she'd be in a room surrounded by rock musicians having cocktails. They're like, who's that lady over there? It's like Dave's mom. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> that was so, so much fun. Okay. So now I imagine most musicians that have made a big don't look back on the days traveling to gigs and vans very fondly. But you, on the other hand, have lots of fun remembrance and your new documentary, What Drives Us. So by traveling in van, how did it impact your perspective and strengthen the bonds with your bandmates? Well, I mean, that movie... When we started that movie, it was one of the reasons why I made that movie is because we still have the van that we toured in 26 years ago. We still got it. It's got 250,000 miles on it. It's in the parking lot of the studio. And to me, it's more than just like this bucket of rust, you know, like this, this rolling wagon with, uh, with amplifiers and stuff in it. To me, it represents something more because 
it's those early years when you're first starting out that lay a foundation for everything else to be built upon, right? So <clears throat> usually when you're in that van, you're in that van because your heart tells you to do it. You know, you're not jumping in a stinky old van with your buddies because you think you're going to be the biggest band in the world. You're just doing it because you have to do it. Like you have to breathe. Like it, you need it like air. And so, and that's the way every musician begins, whether it's Ringo Starr from the Beatles or the guys from the Chili Peppers or Metallica, whatever it is, it begins there. And if it begins there and you like put in the hours and cut your, you know, cut your teeth and, um, and, and really kind of pay your dues that way, then eventually if you wind up finding success, you don't take it for granted because you remember those days where you're sleeping on floors and sleeping bags and you're making $7 a day and, you know, you're driving 10, you know, 3000 miles a night, whatever. Like, so, you know, now when I'm on my bus with the Foo Fighters, I'm like, oh my God, this thing's, there's a popcorn machine on here. Like, that's amazing. You know, or you're backstage and you're like, you know, there's a dry towel after the show. You're like, oh my God, this is a clean dry towel. Cause I remember the days when there wasn't no popcorn or clean towels, you know, you walk off stage and you just jump in your van and hit the next city. So <clears throat> I think it's really important um, to rely on that, on that uh, perspective, but also in making that movie, I want the next generation of kids to watch it so they can realize how, how simple it really is and how available it really is. And hopefully that'll inspire kids to do it too so then we've got another 10, 20, 30 years of, of music to look forward to, you know, and, and that's those early years when you're doing it, when you're doing it like that, it really makes you appreciate the success that, that comes later. Because believe me, man, I wake up every day and I'm just like, I can't believe it. I cannot believe that I get to do this every day, you know, and it's my job. It's my life. It's, 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 it's a blessing. It really is. So you talked about having to redo the house because you had three young daughters. <laughs> yeah. So how do you manage to balance your responsibilities and obligations as a father? And tell me about your super, super kids, Violet Harper and Fifi. I don't even know Fifi's real name. Yeah, it's Ophelia. She's oh, only, okay. she's six and a half. I know. Um, well, you know, for the longest time, I always thought like, well, someday this music thing will end. And then I'll start a family because I never expected it to last this long anyway. So I thought, well, I'll just do it for a while. And then once it stops, then uh, I'll settle down and start a family. And then as it kept going, um, I it actually I was inspired by Neil Young. I went to this Neil Young concert that he used to do every year in San Francisco. And I saw him with his family and uh, and I thought, wow, well, he could he's doing it. Like, why? Why can't I? You know, and then Jordan and I started a family and it's funny with musicians because <clears throat> ultimately what happens, and I've talked to so many musicians about this, when you have a child and you wind up having to go on tour, it breaks your heart every time you leave. It really does. Like every time you have to say goodbye or kiss a baby in a crib and then hit the road for two weeks, it breaks your heart. And the whole time you're on tour, you miss your kids so bad. So you're out there like you're jet lagged and you're tired and you're exhausted from touring. And then you come home and you got to make up for those two weeks. So you like overcompensate. So you come home and you're just like, all right, let's do this. Let's do that. Let's do that. And you're just like in their face the whole time and you're exhausted and you're, you know, but you, you do it because you, you love to do it so much. Um, you know, over time, all of us now, I think there's 14 kids within all of the Foo Fighters at this point. There's, I, there's a lot of kids. And so, when we book a tour, we don't book a tour for a month and a half. We book a tour for like 10 or 12 days and then we come home for a good week and a half. Then we go out for 12 days. Then we come home for a week and a half because the family is really important to us. And so our lives have been like totally dictated by that for years. I mean, it's been at least a decade. Violet's amazing. She's 15 years old. She's the smartest person in this family. She's brilliant. She's beautiful. She's talented. Harper is 12 years old. She's the most creative in the family. She's like kind of like my mini me. I mean, mini me, and I say that she's 12 years old and she's like five foot six. Okay, she's a, she's a tall kid. 
she's amazing and she's the funniest person I've ever met in my life. And then Fifi, she's six and a half. She's just a tornado, you know? She just wants to like hit the trampoline, swim in the pool, come out and play with me, blah, blah, blah. So I love it, you know, because it it in it gives you it gives you energy and it get, and it renews your love of life because you're watching you're you're watching them take their first steps and in doing that you're sort of retreat retracing your own you know so i love it they're cool man and and we're bud we're buds we're pals like we hang all day long and it's great and didn't you and violet just record you want to talk a little bit about their musical talent because i've seen harper playing drums yeah oh go ahead well, well violet I mean, Violet was just, she was born with the ear and she was born with the voice and um, she needs no instruction. She doesn't need anyone to teach her anything about music. She'll just, she just does it herself. She'll pick up a guitar and learn it and she'll learn Joni Mitchell songs and she'll figure out the weird tunings and then she'll sit down at a piano and she'll learn Bohemian Rhapsody and then she'll sing. So she really has this like, this innate ability just to do it. Um, we record it. She's come out and sing backup vocals with us for a while. And uh, it's great, man. You know, I turn around and I see my daughter on stage singing Foo Fighters songs with me. It feels amazing. Um, Harper, Harper has that same ability. I don't think she's as interested in music. She's like, yeah, whatever. She can play the drums. She can sit down and she can do it. She's like, Meh. she's more, she's more of a creative. Uh, <clears throat> she, she's a, a visual artist. And so, um, and you know, I Fifi, who knows what's gonna happen there? Oh my God. But it's it's a full-time job. You know, I wake up every morning and I make sure that they're out of bed and I get them to breakfast, and then I drive to school, and then at the end of the night, like make sure they're they're in bed and then, you know, it's it's normal dad stuff. It's just that some days I have to go play a stadium. That's 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 the only difference. Yeah, I heard you were the best carpool dad there ever was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So last year you had an epic drum battle with a 10 year old English girl. What was her name? N N her name was, uh, yeah, Nandy Bushnell. Uh, that went viral. How did that challenge come about? And how much fun was it to interact with such a young prodigy in a drum off? Yeah, well, you know, that came at a time when, uh, when all the news and all the internet was like, it was really dark, you know, whether it was, uh, the pandemic or the political situation or whatever. If you opened up your your laptop or looked in your phone, nine times out of ten, you would like you were just get bad news, just bad news. And there was this girl; she was ten years old, never met her before, but I'd seen her. She was on TV. She's on like Ellen playing drums, and mm -hmm. she sort of made a name for herself as this drum prodigy. And um, one day, I got a someone texted me and said, "Hey, man, this this kid's challenging you to a drum battle." I was like, "What?" And so I looked and I watched her and she was in, in the camera. She's like, Dave Gold, she's English. I challenge you to a drum battle. And I was like, oh, that's so cute, you know? And then everybody's like, no, 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 you, you got to respond. Dude. You, you got to step up. She's challenging you. So I responded and it became this viral sensation. I think because it was the one thing that you could find on the internet that would make you smile. And it was like, people needed that. People needed some escape or relief or joy or something because everything was just, there's so much bad news that, um, that the two of us wound up having this drum battle. And, um, and she, she whooped my butt, man. I mean, she's like such an amazing drummer. She's great. But, um, but, but it really inspired me because I thought like, that's what the world needs now. Like the world needs joy. They need happiness. They need hope. They need escape. They need... And so it was in that moment that I thought, you know what, we got to put out a record. I don't care if we can hit the stage yet, but people need music because they need that that uh, that relief from everything that was going on. But man, she kicked my butt so hard. Everyone made so much fun of me. Oh my God. Oh, there's so much more I want to talk to you about. I want to know what inspired you. Um, what's next for you? I want to know, I know you had this relationship with the Beatles with, you know, very special Paul McCartney. And there's so much more I want to talk to you about, but 
our time is up. And I just want to thank you so much for taking time from your crazy busy schedule for allowing us not only to know you as Dave Grohl, the wonderful, you know, musician, but also as Dave Grohl, the wonderful human being that you really <laughs> are. And thank, you, thank you. And we all love you. No wonder everybody says you're the nicest guy around. Oh my God. Well, let me tell you, we're coming back to Rehoboth at some point. Like once, once, once everything slows down, I'm going to see you back on that beach and we got to get back out there. Your bathing suit. Ah, oh, you look good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Love. Tell everybody I said hello, would you? I will. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Edie. Great to see you.